So let's say a prayer and dive into our message for the day and ask God to bless our time together. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done, but specifically on Easter Sunday for giving us just the chance to assemble as your people, to celebrate the empty tomb. But God, as we also celebrate the empty tomb, we're not celebrating a hunk of rock with a stone rolled away. We're not celebrating emptiness. We're celebrating what that signified in light of what you did on the cross. That resurrection implies there was death. And we ask ourselves and remind ourselves why. Why that was necessary. Why that was a triumph. And all the aspects of how it applies to us. And so help us today to sift your scriptures. And God, thank you that we don't just have to sift that alone. But we have the weight of history wonderful Christian men, women, scholars, humble, loving, orthodox, looking to stay true to what Jesus spoke as he explained himself to those men walking on the road to Emmaus and how all the scriptures concerned him. Help us to look to Jesus in light of all of that in your name today. Amen. Well, let's go back, not 2,000 years, but 400 years. That last year we actually celebrated a pretty pivotal point in, in historical Christianity, a little thing called the Reformation. That hit 500 years last year. But we actually hit a 400-year celebration mark of another significant pivotal confession that was written down called the Canons of Dort. So this year, actually, six, uh, 1618, now 2018, 400 years have passed since another pivotal piece of writing we actually use as one of the confessionals as our church and part of our denomination. So take yourself back, if you will. Try to imagine, as you all know, what it was like to live in 1618, right? Just a couple of you. But um, the Dutch had become increasingly discontented with what was called Habsburg rule. That was actually, that's how oversight and authority were coming in a combination of powers from both Austria and Spain. If you were Dutch, you didn't have a lot of individual authority in your area. A major cause of the discontent was heavy taxation imposed on the population. That sound familiar? Taxation without representation? While support and guidance from the government was hampered by the size of the empire. The empire was so big that it was impractical, it was, it was impossible almost to gain permission to take actions. Right? So it's like the, the president, it would take weeks for a response to get back. Like, how we'd like to do this. Well, now by the time you get your permission, it's too late. The presence of Spanish troops also further amplified the unrest. Spain attempted a policy of strict religious uniformity for the Catholic Church within its domain and enforced it with a little thing some of you might remember called the Inquisition. The Reformation had happened a century before and it produced a number of Protestant denominations and they'd gained followers in the 17 provinces. And actually, there were a lot of people being oppressed, some killed. So this would be a part of what we historically call the 80 Years' War. Would have loved to be alive then. Um, but in 1609, there was actually a truce that had provided, a, a period of truce that provided some concessions from Spain. A man named Jacob Arminius had actually passed away, and his followers presented objections to the Belgian Confession, which we'll actually be dealing with as a church quite a bit as well. And the teachings of a man named John Calvin, Theodore Bayes, and some other guys. These objections were published in a document called the Remonstrance of 1610. The Arminians were therefore known as the Remonstrance. They had a different interpretation of important biblical texts and disputed aspects of clarity of Scripture that had just been regained through the Reformation. There were also political suspicions, too. This wasn't all fighting over theology. The, the disputers, some thought, were seeking to actually compromise with the Spanish. So political issues were needlessly mixed in with that search for theological integrity. That, that never goes well. So 400 years ago, a gathering happened called a synod, and it was in a place called Dordrecht. That's why I call it the Synod of Dort. And the purpose was to settle this controversy, to make sure we were clear on Scripture. And we've been moving through this week by week as a church, but what's really interesting is by the time you get to Easter, there's nine pieces of that that articulate a very important point. The, synod, the purpose of the synod itself was to settle that controversy and produced a crisp, clarifying document. In every century, guys, this isn't new. In every century, every culture, every time there's been a translation, every community, we face an ever-increasing possibility of drift. In fact, it's been happening since the garden. 
All the devil does is he doesn't come in and try to tell you the opposite of what you hear. He just tries to tweak a word or two. Our spiritual adversaries, which are very real. Also, our own hearts like to distort. Also, conceited cultures can tend to distort. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. Our same desires, our same self-deceiving, and our same ability to be distracted. But the more things change, God stays the same. Truth does not vary. So as there was a tug of war to kind of change the center point of the gospel in 1618, 400 years later on Easter Sunday, we joined in that same need to talk about constancy. Now even I blanch at the word constancy. All right, it evokes memories for me of watching The Simpsons and, and a pastor named, and a reverend named Lovejoy. And there's this one great episode where he talks, he's teaching the congregation on the nine tenets of constancy. Sweet, sweet constancy. And about this time, people start to snooze. He actually has a button. Hey. Hmm. He has a button to wake people up because he's putting them to sleep. So even I, Blanche, when I hear the word constancy, I'm not invigorated with excitement and energy. But I was watching another movie last week, uh, Pacific Rim, the first one, prepping to see the sequel, of course. And there was a soldier, there's a pivotal scene where a soldier's arguing with his commander. You don't really need to know the context, they're, you know, arguing about giant robots and monsters, but he's arguing with his commander, played by Idris Elba, who's a powerful screen presence. And we find out, we see clearly that, that Elba's character will brook absolutely no argument with this hotshot pilot. And he says to him very distinctly, he stops him, he makes his talking cease, he says, all I need to be to you and everybody on this dome is a fixed point. The last man standing. And our question as we look at Easter is will we recognize a commander in chief above all men, our creator, our Lord, our Savior, our fixed point upon which everything, my morality, my daily actions, pivot. Will we recognize him not just as the last man standing, but the first man to rise from the dead? Fully God and fully man. Proverbs 3 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Our hope on Easter Sunday rests on a fixed point. Roughly 2,000 years ago in human history. And not on an event, but on a person. And so rising from the grave with the promise of eternal life and restoration to who and what we were meant to be apart from sin, that's what we want to remain fixed to. And so today, we're not going to look at the nine points of constancy, but we are going to look at nine points of Christ's death and human redemption through it. And so let's just dive right in. We'll do the adult version. We'll get to the kids' version. Article 1 talks about the punishment which God's justice requires. And I'll read this for you as it was written and translated, of course, but still in the same spirit as it was done 400 years ago. God is not only supremely merciful, amen, amen. but also supremely just. This justice requires, as God's revealed in the Word, that the sins we've committed against His infinite majesty be punished with both temporal and eternal punishments of soul as well as body. It goes on to say we cannot escape these punishments unless satisfaction is given to God's justice. Right? God is perfect everything. Sometimes we get kind of on a little hobby horse on one of these or another, and we have to remember he's perfect everything. Yes, everybody likes to hear God is love. That sounds very sweet. God is love. He's also God is justice. God is also perfect mercy. God is also perfect wrath when it needs to be meted out. And God is perfect justice. Justice cannot be just dismissed. We're not going to worry about justice being done. Justice must be satisfied. We'd want that in anything in our lives. We want justice to be satisfied as we were wronged. Imagine you're at a diner. Imagine I invite my friend to that diner. Say, let's go to breakfast over at Stricker's down in Linwood. And then when we get there, and I tell my friend, hey, don't worry about it. I'll pay. It's on me. And then it gets there. And then after we're, about, we're wrapping up, we're done with the hash browns, we're done with the eggs, we're done with the pancakes. Some of you are getting hungry. I reach down, and, and this is not here. That's why I keep a chain on it, actually. <laughs> and now I'm just like, oh, I forgot my wallet. I, I said I'd pay, but I forgot my wallet. I can't pay. Well, so my friend forgives me, and we just walk out, right? No. 
No, the waiter or the waitress is going to have a little problem with that. Right? My, the, my friend I, is going to have to, someone is going to need to satisfy my debt. If my friend says, I forgive you and we leave, that's unjust. Payment is required. What if your friend didn't bring any money either because he said you were paying? And now you're both in trouble. It's the same with sin. We've all sinned. We're all in this diner called life, and we don't have our wallets. We have no currency to deal with the dead. We have an outstanding tab called justice, and justice needs to be satisfied. And so guess what? That means we've got our first one. God is love, kids. God is love, but he's also perfect justice. Right? We love stories of justice. We love Superman standing for truth and justice. We love it when we have characters who are Avengers or Spider-Man and are seeking justice. We like justice. God is perfect justice. Justice must be satisfied. And that gets us to Article 2, the satisfaction made then by Christ. The canons say, since however we ourselves cannot give this satisfaction or deliver ourselves from God's wrath, God in boundless mercy has given us his guarantee, his only begotten Son, who is made to be sin and a curse for us in our place on the cross in order that he might give satisfaction for us. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 2 Corinthians says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Question, how do you unsin? How do you unsin? Right? I mean, you can pay your restaurant tab, technically. Like, if, if no metaphor, no parallel works perfectly in life. You can pay your restaurant tab. You can even, you know, you might even be able to run home and run back and avoid the offense and none's really taken. But what about a sin? If I lie, but then tomorrow I come clean and tell the truth, that doesn't mean I didn't deceive them. The wrong still happened. That's like saying, well, I dined and dashed yesterday, but today I came and paid, so we're good, right? And like, no, you ate another meal. That does... See, we seem to like to think that our sin and our salvation can be something that's scale-based, and Scripture never talks about that. Here's the kicker. The good thing I did today doesn't make up for the bad I did yesterday. If I knocked out an old man's cane and laughed, ha, 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 as he fell down, and then the next day I wheeled him across the street in his wheelchair, does that mean we're good? No, he wouldn't be in the wheelchair unless I put him there. Right, if I, if I spilled, if yesterday I spilled a bunch of coffee on my shirt and got stains on it, but today I drank it really carefully and didn't spill anything on it, that would mean it was unstained now, right? No. No, thank you. <laughs> right, sin, sin is a permanent stain no human can wash out. You can't unsin your sin. What gets those stains out? This is where we get to learn two big words for the adults today. The first one's imputation. Imputation is the attributing of actions to a source. It usually involves like, imputing the actions. Imputation takes words or actions and ties them to a person or a cause. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Romans 5.19 says, So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Right? The penalty for sin, death, is put on one who never sinned and didn't deserve it. Our sinful words and actions are imputed to Jesus. And so then his righteousness, he can then impute that to us and attribute it to us. Our actions are put on a source called Savior. Our actions are imputed to him. Satisfaction is made. Someone took that penalty and imputed his righteousness to us. The other word we look at is atonement, a little more familiar probably to most of us. The reparation for a wrong or injury. The reparation or expiation for sin. And even in the definition, usually even in Merriam-Webster's, it even has as the third one a recognition that talks that's dealing with the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. He paid the debt we could not pay. He paid the tab. And how did he pay it? He became our substitute. He became our substitute. So that's number two for those who are paying attention. All right, guys? We can't save ourselves from sin. We cannot save ourselves from sin. We need who? Jesus. Amen. Article 3 talks about the value of Christ's death. 
This death of God's Son is the only and entirely complete sacrifice and satisfaction for sins. So it's of infinite value and worth, more than sufficient to atone for the sins of a whole world. Right? That's key because Scripture says it's the only. John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through me, he says. God does not have alternate plans. God does not have contradictory plans. God has one rescue mission that's unfolded throughout all of human history. My friend Arjuna came to faith actually reading the Hindu Vedas and reading about this man called Jesus Christ. And he just sat there and read, wait, if there's multiple incarnations and these multiple paths, Jesus suffered and died in agony and horror. That incarnation and that suffering, if there's another way, was totally unnecessary. So he left the Hindu scriptures and he went and he looked at the Bible and became a Christian. Because Jesus is the only way. There's not multiple incarnations. God has one non-contradictory, ultimate, perfect plan. And it's more than sufficient. We don't need more. None would suffice. And it's all that's needed. Now it's sufficient, yes. But the question then is, does it? actually literally atone for the sins of the whole world. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's make sure our kids can write down the truth of the matter. And that's this, right? Jesus' love is big enough for the whole what? World. Whole world. It's big enough for the whole world. It's big enough, absolutely. The question is then, who actually is covered by it? The whole world? Well, we read on. Article 4 says reasons for this infinite value. It says the death of such great value and worth for the reason that the person who suffered it is. As was necessary to be our Savior, the person who suffered it is not only a true and perfect holy human, but also the only begotten Son of God. Of the same eternal and infinite essence with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Another reason that this death was accompanied by the experience of God's wrath and curse, which we by our sins had fully Deserve. That's the hard one to swallow. Hosea 13 summarizes this truth that's taught through Scripture that Jesus is God, by the way. Hosea 13 says, Yet I am the Lord your God, ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there's no Savior besides me. There's no Savior besides God. So if Jesus is Savior, who's Jesus? There we go. New Testament writers also pointed out that God alone is Savior. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. That as the just punishment for sin is eternal separation from God. Our sin makes us guilty. Our sin makes us deserving of wrath and curse. And since no finite number of good actions and thoughts can bring us closer to an infinite righteousness that's needed, we needed an infinitely atoning sacrifice that would cover all sins for all time, past, present, and future. Isaiah 9 says, For a child will be born to us. A son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be, some of you know this by heart, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The child that will be born, the son that will be given, will be called Mighty God. That's Jesus. John chapter 1 says, The word that spoke everything into existence became flesh and dwelt among us. And as for that last part, like my that morning vitamin that I take it's really huge and it's sort of bitter and hard to swallow but I need to Jesus experienced God's wrath and curse that we that I by my sin fully deserved and this is the hard one that even our kids can understand because there's such great joy and promise on the back of it right so kids here we go we do not deserve Jesus love but he gives it anyway we don't deserve it we don't earn it. But he gives it anyway. We deserve, our, we deserve justice. We deserve the justice of God, but Jesus offers a love that provides mercy and justice by way of imputation and atonement. The question remains, who receives this? Who receives perfect mercy instead of perfect justice? Both of which would be appropriate for God to do and perfect. Well, Article 5 talks about then the mandate to proclaim the gospel to all. As it says, moreover, it's the promise of the gospel that whoever believes in Christ, whoever believes in Christ crucified, shall not perish but have eternal life. It goes on to say, this promise, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be announced and declared without differentiation or discrimination to who? All nations, 
and people to whom God in his good pleasure sends the gospel. According to a, a survey recently, there are over there are about two point in 2010, 2.19 billion Christians around the world. More than three times as much from the 600 million recorded in 1910. If studies and trends continue as as, stat, as, as people gifted with statisticians' minds far beyond mine, expectation is by 2050 the Christian population could be around 2.9 billion. I'm praying to crack three. Eleven disciples 2,000 years ago. As Jesus has, no matter what anyone wants to believe about him, indisputably changed the face of the entire world over the last 2,000 years. It's not just a religion for the Jews. It's not just a religion for white people or Westerners. The chart bears that out. It's not, it's not just a religion for both Americas, or it's even for Canadians. I mean, it's glorious. The empty tomb has filled the world. Now, to be clear, that's, that's professing people. We don't know the, I don't know the condition of people's hearts. I don't have a magical, you know, open them up spiritually and look inside. Being a Christian is easy to say. That's true. Even believing, the Scripture says, Scripture says even demons believe and tremble. So what does receiving perfect mercy require? First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus tells us in Luke's gospel, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. We have to believe, we have to confess, and we have to repent. And repent's a big word, but for our kids, we'll just have them filled in the blanks, and some of us can be reminded what it means too. All right, here we go, guys. God asks us to turn away. That's what repent means, turn away. It's to turn from something. And actually, in context, it means to turn to something which would be turned from my sin to God. Turn away from sin, believe in Jesus, and what's our gospel commission? Tell others about him. Tell others about him. That's part of what this day is about and all the other ways that we profess him and proclaim him throughout the year. But the reality is not everyone hears and believes, turns away, puts their faith in Jesus. Or even if they say they believe, they don't repent and he's not really part of their lives or their word or deeds. If their heart isn't, cha isn't changed then, if, if the heart doesn't change, here's the question then, which some people ask, whose fault is it? Article 6 talks about unbelief, a human responsibility. Spoiler. It says, however, that many who have been called through the gospel do not repent or believe in Christ, but perish in unbelief is not because the sacrifice of Christ offered on the cross is deficient or insufficient, but because they themselves are at fault. Is it God's fault? No. No. And that's a key one for us to know, too. And another important truth that even the kids need to learn, right? If we don't believe in Jesus, we have no one to blame but ourselves. If we don't believe in Jesus, we have no one else to blame. We, we can't blame our parents. We can't blame that hypocrite who put a bad taste in our mouth. We can't blame other religions for blurring things up. We can't blame secular culture, the world, and all of its you know, great distractions. And we can't blame the devil. These, to be clear, these things might not have helped. These things might have been extra hindrances. But we don't get to play victim with our rejection. And that's a cold, hard truth. But like, like that daily vitamin, I have to take that. I need to hear that and know that. I need to know I can't shift the blame. I need to know maybe others are culpable for throwing extra hurdles at me, but the main hurdle's right here. Article 7 tells us faith is God's gift. All who genuinely believe and are delivered and saved by Christ's death from their sins and from destruction receive this. They receive this favor solely from God's grace, which God owes to no one, given to them in Christ from eternity. That's key, too. The minute we think God owes us grace, or anyone grace for that matter, then we've misunderstood it, and we aren't humbled or contrite like those he gives it to. Remember, God owes us nothing. Back at that diner, if I didn't pay the tab, one answer might be I'd wind up in the back room, right, washing dishes. I don't think anybody does that anymore, but maybe back in the old days. 
Right? I'd be just I'd be back in that filthy room dealing with the dirty dishes until the day I worked off my debt. But now what do I do if my debt against is isn't against just your average restaurant guy, but against an eternal restaurant owner? And a tab that condemns me eternally. That's a lot of dishes. I'm washing dishes in the back room, sweating and miserable forever. The restaurant doesn't owe me anything. I owe him everything. But instead, the restaurant owner, what if it happened that the restaurant owner walked in and said, believe it or not, my son has paid the tab for you. If you accept that, if you believe that, you're free to go. Now, that's not justice. That's what's called undeserved favor. That's the definition of grace. Unearned merit. That's what grace means. And he's not just being dismissive. It's not overlooking the debt. That would make God unfair. If he overlooked your sin, but not some other person's sin, that would be unfair. He literally had his son come in and pay the tab. See, some don't get grace. Some get justice. And justice is fair. Grace is also fair because Christ's death is sufficient for sin, provided there's true belief in the one who paid it. True faith and true repentance and light of it. An eternal God pays the price you were supposed to pay, or you pay the price you deserve to pay eternally. No belief and faith in Christ, no repentance, well then there's no imputation. There's no ap application. Because faith is not something we deserve. And that's number seven for the kids that are watching along. Right? Faith is God's loving gift to us. I don't earn my Christmas presents. I didn't earn any Easter stuff that was in a basket or that some rabbit allegedly left. Right? It's a gift that's not required. Gifts must be also then be accepted. Some say, I don't believe it. I don't need it. It's going to be a sad and devastating day when we stand before the Lord without his gift. Article 8 talks about the effectiveness of Christ's death. It says, For it was the entirely free plan and very gracious will and intention of God the Father that the enlivening and saving effectiveness of his son's costly death should work itself out in all the elect. That's it's the word we see through the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God refers to those who are his as his chosen people. We see this word elect turn up in the New Testament scriptures. It says, In order that God might grant justifying faith to them only and thereby lead them without fail to salvation. In other words, it was God's will that Christ through the blood of the cross, which he confirms the new covenant with, should effectively redeem from every people, every tribe, every nation, and every language, all those and only those who were chosen from eternity to salvation and given to him by the Father. That Christ should grant them faith, which, like the Holy Spirit's other saving gifts, he acquired for them by his death. And God speaks sweepingly in Scripture, passionately about destiny and his foreknowledge and a plan that preceded time itself in his love. His plan in a story that stretches across the canvas of the universe. And we're a big part of that. That should overwhelm our senses. The creator of the cosmos had me in mind before the first sun glimmered. It goes on to say it was, only, it was also God's will that Christ should cleanse them by his blood from all their sins, both original and actual, whether committed before or after their coming to faith. Guys, sin has messed us up before we were born. Some churches don't teach this very well, but it explains a lot of things. Since the first man and first woman sinned, the earth has been under a curse. We, we see it in the first few chapters of the Bible. It has an effect on both body and spirit. We are created with immortality in mind. Something's changed, right? We lost that by way of sin, so every boy and girl born after sin inherits a sin nature. We don't like that idea, but it explains a lot of what's wrong with me, to be quite honest. Some Christians argue a lot over whether certain dispositions or distortions in our identity, like are they behavior, are they behavioral, are they biological? The argument usually is, if it's biological, maybe then it's not bad, but that's not biblical. We're messed up from the womb, our dispositions are bent. I don't need a miracle to fix all the things I've messed up in my life to get me back to who I was from day one. I need a miracle to make me a new creation because I was born broken. I don't need restoration. I need to be, as Jesus literally tells a man named Nicodemus, born again. Our late finishes up by saying above that Jesus should faithfully preserve them to the very end. And that he should finally present them to himself, a glorious people, without spot or wrinkle. Guys, in Christ we're a new creation. The old is gone. The new is come. And it's my prayer that all of you would know this true and real salvific forgiveness in Christ our Lord. 
The creator of the universe is reconciling everything. And it's my hope everyone here seeks his grace that saves us from what justice would otherwise demand. The good news is, as our kids get to write in, right, Jesus is saving people from every tribe. It means every country, every people group, every color, every language. And he says, if you are saved in Christ, you are kept safe forever. And that brings us to the last one. Article 9, the fulfillment of God's plan. This plan, arising out of God's eternal love for the elect from the beginning of the world to the present time, has been powerfully carried out and will be carried out in the future. The gates of hell seeking vainly to prevail against it. I love that. Some things never change. In 1618, there was oppression of God's people. In, 20, in 2018, there are systems and spiritual warfare that can dishearten us, that can pull at the fabric of our faith, that can try to get us to deny or distort or compromise. But we're truly told that God's plan and love predated all of that. It predated existence. And so you know what? Nothing in existence will steal his chosen out of his hand. We have trust in him because there is no greater power. Amen? Amen. Finishes with the above. As a result, the elect are gathered into one, all in their own time. And there is always a church of believers founded on Christ's blood. Let's fill in that last blank, shall we? All those Jesus saves are gathered together and called as what? His church. All those Jesus saved are called, gathered together, and called his church. And Article 9 finishes by saying, a church which steadfastly loves, persistently worships, and here and in all eternity praises him as her Savior, who laid down his life for her on the cross as a bridegroom for his bride. Revelation 19 has a fantastic passage. It says in verse 6, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride, the church, has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is what? The righteous deeds of the saints. Friends, as the members of God's church wrestled with faithfulness to God's holy scripture 400 years ago, faithful members here today around the world, but at Refuge Church, confess the basics and essentials of our faith today. Today we actually have the joy as part of the message to have three young men become members of our church, confessing members. Men who serve, but now as, as boys becoming men, now they're ready to say they're not just a member because they're part of their dad's and mom's household. They're ready to become members because they're adults and believe. Christ is their constancy. Confessing members, that means they've also been baptized prior to this. But now as adults in the eyes of our culture, they want to confess what it means to be part of the bride of Christ, which we just heard. And so today we get to celebrate the resurrection by seeing its effects of transformation on the lives, not just 400 years ago, not just 2,000 years ago, not just men on the road of Emmaus, but men right here in Refuge Church. His death and resurrection is the fixed point. Submission and recognition to their commander-in-chief is what they and we will do together here in a moment. For our identity, for our direction, and in light of what's been done, and our grace-infused destination, his kingdom and his family forever. God's people said...